Hey folks, this is Mr. Wilkins here. Welcome to my video lecture on chapter 11 of Give Me Liberty. In this chapter, we're going to dive deep into slavery in the United States in the late 1700s and the first half of the 1800s or the 19th century, leading up to the Civil War um, and what life was like in the Old South, uh, why slavery grew and the kind of society that was built uh, that was based on slavery. Um, so here's a, uh, a, a painting from this time period that shows what an American slave market might have looked like. Although oftentimes, as you may know, uh, slaves were often auctioned with very little clothing to show off their, their physical strength and their physical capabilities. Um, the chapter starts with uh, this gentleman, Frederick Douglass. Why? Because this is the time period when he uh, becomes a known figure. He is born into slavery uh, in the state of Maryland uh, and eventually uh, emancipates himself, escapes, and becomes a well-known abolitionist, outspoken critic of slavery and racism, uh, publishes several books. Um, and his first autobiography uh, is a major bestseller and really shatters some of the myths about uh, slavery that existed in, in the United States at the time. And this was a time period where the South, the slave states were known as today, we call them the Old South. This was the South of slavery. This was the South before the Civil War. And this was a time period when cotton is king. Cotton had replaced sugar as the world's major crop produced by slave labor. In countries like Cuba and Brazil, uh, sugar was the major crop produced by slave labor. And it had been for a good while in the United States, along with tobacco. But cotton is truly going to become king. Uh, and the strength of American slavery is going to rest on the production of cotton. In fact, three-fourths of the world's cotton supply is going to come from the southern United States. And part of this, or a large part of this, is because of the invention of the cotton gin uh, by Eli Whitney. Uh, and that's a, a small device that is going to make it easier to mass-produce cotton because the machine removes these tough seeds that you would oftentimes have to use uh, physical labor to remove, slave labor to remove, but the cotton gin is going to make that a lot easier. And so plantations are going to expand to just grow more and more cotton. Uh, and a lot of this, this cotton supply is going to go to textile mills in the northern United States, as well as Great Britain. So even those states that did not have slavery are going to depend on slavery for the supply of cotton. And then countries like Great Britain, uh, their industry is going to rely on production of cotton from the United States too. And again, as I mentioned before, early in the 1800s, uh, cotton becomes the most important export of the United States. During this same time period, uh, the United States is going to end the importation of slaves. I mean, it would happen still. Slaves would still be smuggled in. But uh, in 1807, Congress is going to pass a law banning the importation of slaves from the Caribbean or from Africa. However, uh, the slave trade is still going to flourish in the United States and, and increase demand for slaves because there is less of a supply coming from outside of the country. And this is kind of surprising uh, because in most countries with slavery, uh, the number of slaves are going to die. They are not going to have families. They are not going to have offspring. But in the United States, we're actually going to see a growth of slavery uh, or growth of, of the slave population. In 1790, we had just shy of 700,000. Fast forward to 1860 with the outbreak of the Civil War, we'll have just under 4 million. And this, there's a lot we can read into this. Um, first of all, it tells you something about the conditions that slaves were kept in. Uh, as terrible as slavery is, there were other countries where, where it was even worse. Um, but more importantly, it tells us that about something about the people, these people who were enslaved, that they wanted to have families, they wanted to have children, uh, they wanted stability. Uh, and that tells us a lot about their character, about their dreams, their hopes. Um, but this is something that is absolutely fascinating. And we'll talk about it later, about what their lives were actually like and why they would even want to have children in the midst of something as oppressive and horrific as slavery. Uh, here's a map that shows you where the slave population was. The spots of green shows you uh, where they were. One dot represents 200 slaves. So you can see in areas like uh, Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina and stretches of Alabama, you had a high density of slaves, um, but they were spread out all throughout these states where you see specks of green. Uh, 
So southern cities, uh, of which there weren't too many big ones, they were the ones where you would purchase slaves and where the auctions would take place. Um, whereas most of the slave labor took place on farms and plantations outside of these cities. And as I mentioned before, the North was not immune to slavery. Northern merchants and manufacturers uh, traded in slaves. Uh, they also needed the what was produced by slave labor, the food, the cotton, to work in their mills. And it shaped the lives of all Americans, it, it, even those people who tried to, uh, to just ignore slavery. It is going to affect their life. But the Southern economy truly depended on slavery. Southern economic growth was very different from Northern growth. Again, there were very few large cities in the South, unlike in the North, where you had places like New York City and Boston and Philadelphia. Um, in the South, New Orleans was the only, si the only significantly sized city. Uh, and the region of the South overall produced less than 10% of the nation's manufactured goods. They produced the vast majority of agricultural goods at this time, particularly cotton, uh, but manufactured goods came from northern states. Here's an image of New Orleans in 1860, right before the outbreak of the Civil War. And in the Civil War, New Orleans would be pretty quickly captured by uh, Union forces, which would uh, damage uh, the Confederacy's attempts uh, to rebel uh, from the start of the war. So in the Old South, you had the plain folk, or just ordinary uh, common workers, uh, three-fourths of whom did not own slaves, uh, and they supported themselves with uh, just their, themselves and their families growing their farms. However, even though they didn't own slaves and they didn't even use slave labor, they still supported slavery. Um, they didn't necessarily like the plantation owners, future President Andrew Johnson and others. They hated the, the elites, the ones who, who owned vast plantations because they thought uh, they, they held everybody else down. However, uh, most of, of these lower class white folk, the plain folk, did support the planter elite uh, just because they felt a sense of loyalty to them in the region. Um, they agreed with them in their racist, racist views. And, and also they were just family. And it's very difficult to disagree with your family. Here's a photo uh, of folks sitting outside of, what their, of their one room or two room uh, home that they probably would have built. Then you have the planter class. Some of those elite uh, in 1850, the majority of slaveholding families, they owned five or fewer slaves. Um, and fewer than 2,000 families actually owned 100 slaves or more. And those who owned slaves, it was obviously a sign of wealth, status, and influence. Because if you had slaves doing all your work, you had time to get involved in government and to go get educated and to kind of live a fancy social life. Um, here's a photo of what one of these auction houses would have looked like. You would have seen this sign out here and you would have gone in and uh, they would have been able to, they would have auctioned uh, slaves in those buildings. And slavery, above all, was a profit-making system. So a lot of these plants are elite. They would keep an eye on the price of cotton. Uh, they would spend their times trying to build up their plantations, manage their plantations. Uh, the mistresses, their wives, uh, would they would kind of be responsible for taking care of the slaves' day-to-day -day lives. They would oversee any other servants that they have, uh, domestic servants who would be slaves who worked in the home. Uh, and if they were away, they kind of oversaw the plantation. So during the Civil War, when a lot of men go off to fight, women the women were left in charge of the plantations. Um, so th there was this myth that existed for a long time. You still hear about today that slavery was kind of run by the men. Uh, but women played just as big a part, um, and in some cases, an, an even harsher, crueler part uh, in slavery. So the women are the, the, the white women, the mistresses of the plantation, um, in a lot of cases, they, they bore just as much guilt as, uh, as their husbands. And these slave owners would spend a lot of their money on material goods. Running a plantation is a, you have to have a fertilizer and crops, uh, or excuse, fertilizer and seeds and tools and land, things that are very expensive. Um, and you want, they would live in these massive plantation homes as well. And they looked at their slaves not really as slaves, but they often viewed them as children, and that they were their father. Uh, this idea of paternalism. Uh, pater is Latin for father, so paternalist is, is this idea of being the father. Um, and so they justified a lot of their measures as saying, oh, we're, we are uh, you know, really the parents of, 
of these children, um, which was obviously a very degrading point of view uh, towards slaves, those who were grown men and women, um, grandparents in and of themselves. And so this lessened their view of them uh, and, uh, as actual humans. So here you go with a, a breakdown in 1850 of the numbers of slaves. So the number of slaves owned, you had 68,000 slaveholders who owned just one slave, all the way up to 250 slaveholders who had 200 plus. So in this paternalist system, uh, they developed arguments as to uh, why slavery should exist and continue and spread. Um, by the 1830s, fewer Southerners believed that slavery was a necessary evil. They actually thought it wasn't evil at all. They thought it was a good thing. Um, and this was based on several ideas. Number one, white supremacy, that the white race, Anglo-Saxon race, was simply superior and was asserting its natural superiority. Number two, religious justification. Um, in the Bible, there are some passages that it could be argued, uh, support slavery or sanction slavery and allow for it. Um, number three, uh, based on history, the idea that you had to have slavery to have human progress. They would point back to places like Rome and ancient Greece where slavery had existed and say, look, these are places we admire and respect and they had slaves. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a natural element. Um, Another pro-slavery argument held that slavery guaranteed equality for whites. So even poorer whites, uh, smaller white families that didn't, in no way could ha own slaves of their own, they still could bond and agree with the planter elites and say, oh, well, hey, we're superior uh, to slaves. So therefore, you know, we, we want to keep that system in place. Um, and again, here's another chart you can check from 1860. Uh, the deep green shows you where the highest density of slaves were, all the way up to white, where there just weren't uh, many slaves, if any. So abolitionism, or the movement to get rid of slavery, uh, became more well-known during the early 1800s. Uh, abolition in the Americas influenced debates over slavery in the United States because you had slavery abolished in countries like Mexico and in countries in Central and South America. Um, pro-slavery advocates used post-emancipation decline in sugar and other cash crops as evidence of British abolitionism's failures. So they pointed to Great Britain, which abolished slavery in their colonies, uh, and in Great Britain, and, and they eventually would abolish the slave trade. They said, oh, this is destroying their economy. See, we want to have a strong economy. We have to maintain slavery. Meanwhile, Abolitionists argued that the former slaves' rising living standards showed that emancipation had succeeded. So in those countries that emancipated slaves, uh, the slaves, now free people, were able to provide for themselves and lived better lives and said, aha, see, emancipation will succeed if we do it in the United States. By the mid-century, by 1850, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas, slavery only remained in Cuba, Puerto Rico, uh, which were both Spanish colonies, in Brazil, where it would last until 1888 and the United States. So how is it in the United States, this country that proclaimed liberty and loved liberty could actually practice slavery? Well, white Southerners actually declared themselves the true heirs of the American Revolution. They really represented what the founding fathers had fought for and supported. Uh, and it, we gotta remember, a lot of the guys who signed the Declaration of Independence and even the Constitution were slaveholders. Um, and pro-slavery arguments during this time period, they actually begin to repudiate or reject the ideas in the Declaration of Independence that equality and freedom were universal entitlements. Uh, John C. Calhoun, who you're familiar with, he actually believed that the language in the Declaration of Independence about life, liberty, and equality uh, was, or, uh, was dangerous. All this talk of all men are created equal. Um, by 1830, Southerners were defending slavery in terms of liberty and freedom. They said without slavery, freedom was not possible. Uh, and one gentleman, George Fitzhugh, himself a slave owner and a writer, argued that universal liberty was the exception, not the rule. That really most societies could not have universal liberty. And so the United States having slaves was, you know, that's just the way things are and the way they should be. So what was life like under slavery? Well, first we got to look at the laws that really made slavery so unique in the United States and made it such a racial issue. So slaves, you got to remember, were considered property. They were not considered humans, which is 
crazy, mind-blowing to think about. They were seen as property, and as property had few legal rights. Slaves could not testify against a white person. They could not carry a firearm. They could not leave the plantation without permission. They could not learn how to read or write legally. Uh, and they also could not gather in a group without a white person present. So their lives were extremely, extremely restricted, uh, whether they were on the plantation or if they were off a plantation. So some of these laws were not always enforced. Um, so masters <clears throat> would sometimes ignore some of these laws. However, they controlled their slaves' lives. They controlled who their slaves married. They controlled how they spent their free time. Um, in one case uh, that came up, you had the trial of Celia, a slave. And Celia uh, actually killed her master uh, when her master was attempting to, to rape her, a sexual assault. So Celia was charged with murder and sentenced to die. But she was pregnant at the time, and her execution was delayed until she gave birth. Why? Because to kill her and kill would kill the baby, obviously, and that would deny her new master his right to the property, uh, which is very disturbing. But this was something that was not uncommon. And yes, rape of uh, slaves happened frequently. Uh, and... And and this is something that is is really just a makes the system of slavery even worse uh, because these these women had no way to really resist. Uh, take a case of Celia who did fight back, and yet she is still punished for her resistance. So remember back at the beginning, I mentioned how the number of slaves, the population of slaves, increased naturally uh, once importation ended, and historians have been fascinated about why this happened. Well, here's why. So American slaves, compared to their counterparts in the West Indies and in Brazil, they enjoyed better diets, lower infant mortality, and longer life expectancies. In the West Indies and Brazil, um, slaves would die oftentimes before they were 20 years old, and the slave conditions were brutal. Um, in the United States, you had this paternalistic ethos where the slave owner said, oh, I have to treat my, the slaves are like my children. I'm going to treat them like my tr children. And so they're going to feed them better. They're going to provide better living conditions. Um, the conditions in the South were also better in, in terms of disease and such. Uh, also, because of the uh, end of the slave trade, importation of slaves, the, pr the value of slaves increased. And so uh, the slave owners, again, viewed their slaves as property, and they didn't want to damage their property. And again, this is it's it's very difficult to to balance this idea of um, of slavery being this terrible, horrible thing that existed for so long in the United States with this idea that oh well, slavery in the United States was a lot better than other places. It, it's it's one of those things that yeah, slavery was better in the United States. It was still terrible. So yeah. Tough thing to keep in mind. Here's a portrait of what it would have looked like. You have the, the owner's family here, the plantation owner's family, and then you have uh, a, a, a black child, a slave child, who would have been kind of a playmate until a certain age, and then suddenly they become their servant. And another slave hiding in the back uh, who possibly was in the same role. At some point, they would have been a playmate, and then at a certain age, instead of just being a playmate or a friend, they become uh, the, the slave of the children. So, was everybody in the South a slave? No. Uh, there were free blacks throughout the United States. If you ever see 12 Years a Slave, that's based, that's based on the true story of Solomon Northrop. He was born free in New York and then was kidnapped and forced into slavery for 12 years before he was uh, freed. Um, and there were free blacks who actually lived in the South. Not very many, though. By 1860, there were nearly half a million free blacks in the United States. Most of them lived in the South, but they were not really welcome there. Um, much as the, even their rights were restricted, even if they, even similar to those who were enslaved. Free blacks were allowed to own property and could marry um, and could not be bought and sold, but they could not testify in court. They could not serve on a jury. Uh, and of course, there was always the danger of them being kidnapped and forced into slavery. Um, there was also a difference between the upper South, states like Tennessee and Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware. Uh, and the Deep South, states like Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina. The majority of free blacks who lived in the Lower South lived in the cities, like New Orleans and Charleston. 
Those who lived in the upper south generally lived in rural areas. They could work as laborers on farms for wages. So life as an actual slave. Well, you were working uh, daybreak to uh, till the end of the day. And there were all sorts of jobs. You could work in the fields. You could work in the barns. You could work in the house. Uh, you could work in, in a, a, a large gang of slaves being uh, overseen by an overseer. Um, the overseer would have a whip or a gun, would direct the slaves how to work, and if a slave resisted, they could shoot them, they could whip them, uh, and things like that. Um, this is a chart that will give you a breakdown of different crops, not just cotton, uh, but you also had uh, sugarcane, you had tobacco still, you had rice in places like Georgia and South Carolina. Um, slavery did exist in the cities, and the cities where there weren't very many farms or plantations, obviously, they would be, uh, they would work in homes. They would be servants, cooks. Uh, they would run errands. Um, they would do housework, uh, keeping up houses, construction. They could be rented out to do all sorts of things. There are colleges um, that use slave labor uh, to, to build their buildings as well. Um, some city slaves were very skilled artisans, worked with animals. Uh, they were craftsmen. Uh, sometimes they would be able to live on their own. And if they made money, part of that money they could keep, uh, but would have to give some of it back to their owner. This gentleman in the middle, this would be an overseer keeping an eye on slaves in the field. And they would need these, uh, these overseers because they maintained a very strict order, very, a lot of discipline, and relied on force, on having weapons. Uh, you could, if a slave broke a law or was out of line, uh, the master legally could whip. Uh, they could... Um, they could always threaten to, to sell a slave, and they would if they were causing trouble. They could hire other people to break a slave. Frederick Douglass had that experience uh, where he had uh, resisted uh, his owner, and his owner hired a slave breaker um, to kind of to, to whip him into shape, into subservient shape. Uh, and Douglass famously uh, fought back and stood up for himself, which was an extreme rarity uh, to do that and to survive. So slave culture is, is a fascinating thing um, to, to read about because in the midst of this terrible situation, slave culture, their lives, they had very vivid and very deep uh, cultural lives. Um, despite the fact that they could be sold at any moment and the fact that marriage was not recognized, was not legal between slaves, uh, slaves did marry. They had families. They were very dependent on their families, on their extended families. They would name their children after other family members to pass on their heritage. Um, and the slave community had a significantly higher number of female-headed household, female headed households than the white community did uh, because of the sale of slaves and the death of, uh, of male slaves as well. There was always the threat of sale. Um, slave owners very rarely, they really didn't pay attention to preserving family ties. Um, in the fields, the traditional gender roles were not really followed. Men and women and children all worked in the fields, boys and girls. Uh, if you could do the work, you did the work. Um, but when they had their own time uh, amongst these the, the slave families, they would fall into traditional gender roles. The women would oversee taking care of the kids. The men would do any extra work uh, to help provide for their families, uh, particularly in cities. Um, here's a, a broadside, uh, basically an advertisement uh, listing slaves and how much they would sell for. And these you would have seen posted around town, you would have seen in newspapers uh, when you went around. Uh, religion played a huge role, particularly Christianity in slave culture. Um, it, and it was very different from another type of, uh, from the other versions of Christianity. Um, almost every plantation, every large plantation had its own slave preacher. Uh, most of the time this would be a white uh, white person, a white man, who would preach about the virtues of slavery and how they should support their master. Sometimes you'd have uh, uh, you would have uh, black, free black, or even slaves themselves who would preach. Um, slaves could worship in biracial churches. They would oftentimes have to sit up top, uh, sit in balconies uh, to worship. Uh, and then free blacks would establish their own churches as well. Um, but masters would oftentimes control what was going on in these churches and try to uh, use sermons and songs and such in those structures to um, to reinforce their authority. Um, but for the slaves themselves, they love to focus on stories uh, about freedom, 
groups like Moses, uh, or the story of Moses and the, and the, and the Hebrews uh, leaving, leaving Egypt were a big part of it. Stories of Abraham in the Old Testament uh, provide a lot of solace and a lot of uh, dreams of freedom, a lot of inspiration. Um, and a lot of, there are a lot of uh, spirituals that stem from this time that are, um, are based on uh, the Old Testament. Elijah is a very dominant figure in some of those stories as well. Uh, and here's a scene of what it might have looked like at a kitchen ball, White Sulphur Springs. Um, so slaves most certainly desired liberty. They, you know, some of them did uh, accept their situation, but many of them wanted to resist. They sensed the injustice of it. Um, and their stories will glorify the weak, overcoming the strong. Um, their songs emphasized eventual liberation, and they resisted. Most slaves resisted in ways of silent sabotage. They would break tools. They would fake that, the, that they were being sick. They just would do a bad job when they were doing their work. Um, in some cases, they would poison their master. They would burn down a barn, burn down a house, or you'd have armed assaults and uprisings. Slaves would also run away. Uh, most slaves who ran away actually would return eventually. Uh, but then, of course, you had those who would run away and, uh, and stay away. Or those who would run away, succeed, and then come back and rescue others and show them the way out. And this would disrupt the stability of the slave system. Um, this map shows every place you see a star. You, there is an example of slave resistance, not just in the United States, but in uh, the Western Hemisphere. So of the estimated 1,000 slaves a year to escape, most of them escaped from the upper south, states like Maryland and Delaware, Kentucky. Um, from the deep south, it was very difficult to escape. Those who did uh, escape would often try to hide out in cities and blend in with the free black population and eventually get onto a ship and sail further away or at least avoid detection. And then, of course, you had the Underground Railroad, which was a loose organization of abolitionists who helped slaves to escape. Uh, Harriet Tubman was somebody who used this to escape and then eventually went back to Maryland uh, to help lead slaves to freedom. So even Harriet Tubman, as amazing as she was, uh, she wasn't able to rescue slaves from the Deep South. She was in Maryland, which was the Upper South. Um, still, even to rescue slaves from Maryland uh, was an amazing feat. And the fact that she didn't have to do that, but she did it willingly, uh, is, is amazing. Here's a sign you would have seen asking for uh, you know, reward for runaway slaves. You would have seen these posted all over, not just southern cities, but even northern cities where a lot of these slaves would hide out. So let's talk about other forms of resistance, the armed resistance. So you had the Amistad, which was a ship uh, that was a slave ship where an uprising took place, and it actually ended up in the United States. Uh, this was a either French or Portuguese ship. I'm afraid I don't remember. So the ship landed in American waters, landed in American port. And it gets all the way to the Supreme Court. The question of what do we do with them? Um, we're not supposed to import slaves, so what do we do? And they argued in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, led by John Quincy Adams, the former president, and he argued that the slaves had been illegally seized in Africa and should be freed. And they were. Uh, they were actually set free. They were not returned to Spain or Portugal. There's a great movie about this uh, that came out a long time ago um, that's still worth seeing. Um, and then in the United States, you had revolts. Slaves just grabbed weapons and rose up. Um, one, known as the German Coast Uprising in 1811, took place in Louisiana. Uh, in 1822, there was a planned uprising in South Carolina, led by a, a, a man named Denmark Vesey. Vesey was religious. He saw slavery as hypocrisy. Uh, but it was uncovered before the uprising could happen, and it was crushed, just like the German Coast Uprising. That was crushed militarily. Uh, slaves were executed, even free blacks were executed, who were believed to have some connection to these. And then you had Nat Turner's rebellion. Nat Turner's was the most uh, well-known of these rebellions. In 1831, Nat Turner and his followers marched through Virginia. They attacked white far families. Uh, there were at least 80 slaves who joined Turner. Um, they killed about 60 whites, uh, mostly women and children, but also seven men, several men. Um, and then they were eventually put down by a militia. Uh, Turner was eventually captured and executed. This was the largest, uh, the last large-scale rebellion in the South, because after this rebellion, uh, Southern states are going to really crack down on uh, slaves having any kind of uh, 
freedoms. Uh, even something like reading and writing are going to be seen as dangerous because Nat Turner was literate and was a preacher. There's going to be more control uh, than even before uh, to slavery. And this sets us up uh, to the time period just before uh, the Civil War. Here's an engraving that shows a popular imagination of what the, that, the slave uh, thing would have been like. Um, and it's after 1831 that slavery's defenders in the Old South are going to close ranks and they're going to be even more vocal in their support of slavery. Um, because there were actually people who said, oh, see, we can't have slavery anymore. We have to end it. And other people said, nope, we're going to make it, we're going to just be more strict. And it's not going to work. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, hope this helped. And we'll ta be talking about some of these things in class.